Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the USMLE Guys. My name is Dr. Paul. Today we're doing another high yield USMLE Step 1 Q&A. Now, this lecture is based on our Step 1 Crash Course, which is a high yield crash course that asks you questions based on material outlined in the first aid. So if you enjoy this and you find it to be useful, you can check out the full crash course in the link description below. The specific topic of this lecture is going to be cellular biochemistry. Let's not waste any more time. Let's dive in with today's Q&A. Hey everybody, welcome back to the next lecture. We're going to start this one with some true or false questions. And as always with true false questions, I'm gonna stick around here with you. Don't pause and then we will discuss the correct answer after every question. So let's dive in with our first question, true or false. What do you think, true or false? This is false. Now. It's partially true, cyclin-dependent kinases are in fact constitutively expressed. However, they will be inactive if they are not bound to cyclin, i.e. they are cyclin-dependent. All right, next question, true or false? What do you think? This is false. Now what makes it false is that cyclins are phase-specific. They are not non-phase-specific. Now they do not, or sorry, they do control cell cycle events and they are needed, of course, to activate that cyclin dependent kinase. All right, next question, true or false? What do you think, is this true or false? This is true. The cyclin CDK complexes will phosphorylate proteins that aid in coordinating the cell cycle progression. Interestingly though, there is a delicate balance between being activated and being inactivated at the right times for the cell cycle to move forward properly. All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false? This is true. Remember, when it comes to tumor suppressors, the P53 protein will induce P21, which causes CDK inhibition, which results in RB hypophosphorylation, which activates RB. This results in halting of the progression of G1 into the S phase. Now, this is why if we get a mutation of a tumor suppressor gene, it prevents this from happening, and we get then uncontrolled, unrestrained cell division. All right, next question. True or false? What do you think, true or false? This is true. So when growth factors like insulin bind to tyrosine kinase receptors, it helps the cell cycle transition from the G1 phase into the S phase. All right, let's move on. Let's do a matching exercise. So we have a big one here. Hit the pause button, figure everything out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answers, and we will discuss everything. All right, so here are the correct answers. If you need to fix anything, hit the pause button, go ahead and do so. Otherwise, let's go through all this information and just to make it easier for you to follow along in your books, um, let's start at the top. We will start at the top and then move our way down, okay? That way you're not jumping around. So let's start with the permanent, stable, and labile cell types. So permanent cell types are those cells that remain in GO or G0 and they don't enter the cell cycle, but rather will regenerate from stem cells. When it comes to this type of cell, think neurologic cells as a prime example of this type of cell. Now, stable cells, these are also known as quiescent cells, and they remain in the G0 phase until they're stimulated to enter the cell cycle, at which point they, of course, enter G1. So they are stimulated when they need to be. Otherwise, they just hang out and wait. The labile cells, now these are your rapidly dividing cells. So think skin, hair, gut epithelium, bone marrow. These have a short G1 phase, and they never enter into G0 because they just need to keep dividing because they're so rapidly dividing and there's a rapid turnover. Now, because of this rapidly dividing nature, these are most sensitive to the negative effects of chemotherapy. Now, let's take a look at the rough and the smooth ER. So the rough ER, this is where we synthesize secretory proteins, which are those proteins that will be exported out. And it's also the site of N-linked glycosylation and that is a process where we add N-linked oligosaccharide to lysosomes or to other proteins. Now, free ribosomes, which are ribosomes that are not attached to any membrane, are the site of synthesis of peroxisomal, cytosolic, 
and mitochondrial proteins. Now, we have something known as nissl bodies. These are the neuronal RER, and these are responsible for the synthesis of peptide neurotransmitters for secretion. Now, a couple types of cells that are very rich in RER are specifically the mucus secreting goblet cells of the small intestine and the antibody secreting plasma cells. So if you get questions and they give you a picture and there's lots of RER, it could be these cells. Now the smooth ER on the other hand is the site of steroid synthesis and it's the site where we uh, gather drugs and poisons and toxins and detoxify. We call it a detoxifi detoxification center. This is also the site of glucose 6-phosphatase. Now don't forget about the Golgi, which we can think of the Golgi as that distribution center for the proteins and lipids from the RER to vesicles and plasma membranes. Now, a few important post-translational events, such as adding mannose 6-phosphate to, ta to tag proteins for lysosomes, as well as the modification of N-oligosaccharides on asparagine and adding O-oligosaccharides on threonine and serine, all occur right here in the Golgi. Now, if the Golgi can't add that mannose 6-phosphate tag to proteins, the lysosomes become deficient in digestive enzymes. and As a result, they accumulate cellular debris. What do we call this disease? We call it eye cell disease. Now, this is the result of a defect in N-acetylglucosamino-1-phosphotransferase. This condition is characterized by coarse facial, facial features, corneal clouding, joint mobility restrictions, gingival hyperplasia, claw hand deformities, increased plasma levels of lysosomal enzymes, and kyphoscoliosis. Now, over the years, I have seen this question about the, the mannose 6-phosphate again and again. So make sure you know that piece of information. Now, another important protein needed for the movement of polypeptide ribosome complexes from the cytosol to the RER is the signal recognition particle, or SRP. If these are deficient or non-functional or absent, proteins will accumulate in the cytosol. The peroxisomes are membrane-enclosed organelles that are involved in a variety of different processes like beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids, um, alpha oxidation of BCFAs, both of which are only done by peroxisomes. As well, it is involved in the catabolism of amino acids and ethanol and the synthesis of a variety of products like bile acids, cholesterol, and plasmalogens. Now, there are some very important disorders associated with peroxisomes that we must know, including adrenal leukodystrophy, Zellweger syndrome, and Refsum disease. So let's talk about these so that you, if you get these, you will absolutely get the answer correct. Easy points. So first, adrenal leukodystrophy. How is this inherited? This is inherited in an X-linked recessive manner. And the reason why this happens is we've got a mutation of the ABCD1 gene that causes a defect in beta oxidation. Now remember, that beta oxidation is needed for those very long chain fatty acids. And so if this is defective, they'll accumulate. Specifically, they accumulate in the brain's white matter, in the testes, and in the adrenal glands. Now, this leads to progressively worsening adrenal gland crisis, makes sense. Progressively worsening neurological dysfunction, makes sense. And because these are so dramatic, it can cause death. Next up is Zellweger syndrome. And this is inherited how? This is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner. And this is a disorder of the biogenesis of peroxisomes caused by a mutation in the PEX1 gene. Now, this gene is needed to make the peroxisomal biogenesis factor 1 protein, which is, of course, needed for the biogenesis of peroxisomes. This condition is characterized by seizures, hypotonia, and death. Now, the final condition here related to peroxisomes is Refsum disease. This, too, like Zellweger syndrome, is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner, and it's associated with defective alpha oxidation. Now, this leads to the buildup of something known as phytanic acid, which is a branched chain fatty acid that requires the process of alpha oxidation for breakdown. As a result of its failure, it builds up because it can't be degraded. Now, patients afflicted with this condition are characterized by having scaly, dry skin. They experience night blindness, ataxia, um, epiphyseal dysplasia, shortening of the fourth toe, as well as cataracts. Now, this can be managed with proper diet and plasmapheresis. Now, the last thing to discuss here is the proteasome. This is a protein complex that degrades damaged proteins or proteins that are ubiquitin tagged. Now, these protein complexes are barrel-shaped and defects are linked to Parkinson's disease. All right, let's move on to the next question. We have a multiple choice question here. 
So as always, go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is B. So let's take a look at the cytoskeletal elements that could pop up on exam day. Now remember, these are a network of protein fibers in the cytoplasm that aid in supporting the cell structure, in cell and organelle movement, as well as in cell division. Now first, let's take a look at microfilaments. These are used in cytokinesis and in muscle contraction. An example of this would be things like microvilli or actin. Intermediate filaments are present to help maintain cell structure. Think of neurofilaments or cytokeratin as intermediate filaments. And then we have microtubules, which are needed for cell division and cell movement. So cilia, flagella, and the mitotic spindle would be good examples of microtubules. Now, these microtubules, they have an outer cylindrical structure, and these are made of polymerized heterodimers of alpha and beta tubulin, and each dimer has two GTP bound. Microtubules contain the molecular motor proteins kinesin and dynein, where dynein is a minus N-directed protein, and kinesin is the opposite. Now, don't forget, there are many drugs that can affect microtubule polymerization and or function, including drugs like griseofulbin, which of course is an antifungal, and mabendazole, which is an anti-helminthic. One of the drugs that we are tested on continuously is colchizine, which is typically used for gout. We can also use it in some of our lab techniques. Uh, remember, colchizine is going to exert its effects by binding to tubulin and blocking the assembly and the polymerization of microtubules. Now, while we're on this topic, let's look at the structure of cilia, which you probably know is that classic nine doublet plus two singlet arrangement of microtubules. The basal body consists of nine microtubule triplets with no central microtubules. The axonemal dynings are associated with microtubule doublets within cilia and flagella, and the ATPases provide the motive force necessary for the cilia and flagella beating by driving the sliding microtubules with respect, with respect to each other. And one of the most often tested pathologies associated with this is the autosomal recessive inherited dining arm defect known as Cartagener syndrome. This is characterized by findings due to impairment of the migration uh, and or orientation of certain structures. So things like recurrent infections happen, infertility because the sperm aren't motile, as well as hearing loss are all um, known common findings of this syndrome. Now, one last nugget to remember about Cartagener syndrome is that we can screen for it by testing nasal nitric oxide levels, which if the syndrome is present, will be decreased. All right, let's move on and do some true false questions, testing our knowledge about collagen and collagen synthesis. So let's get started, true or false. What do you think? This is true. In addition to that nucleus pulposus, the other tissues rich in the type 2 collagen include the hyaline cartilage and the vitreous body. Next question, true or false? What do you guys think? Is this true or is this false? This is true. It is the most abundant protein in the body and it is extensively modified by post-translational modification and it is necessary for both organization and strengthening of the extracellular matrix. Next question, true or false? This is false. Now, if you've gone through the basics of pathology lectures, you would know that we switch this around, meaning early wound repair is mediated by type three collagen, late wound repair is mediated by type one. Next question, true or false? This is true. Right? The basement membranes found throughout the body are very rich in type 4 collagen. And in addition to this, the lens of the eye is also very rich in type 4 collagen. Next question, true or false? What do you guys think? This is true. Right, The most common collagen in the body is type 1. And we find this in the bone, the skin, the tendon, the dentin, the fascia, the cornea. And as I previously mentioned, it is also involved in late wound repair. Next question, true or false? What do you think? True or false? This is false. Osteogenesis imperfecta is due to a decreased production of type 1 collagen. But Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, specifically the vascular type, this is linked to a deficiency of type 3 collagen, while the classic type is linked to faulty, uh, is linked to, uh, faulty type 5 collagen synthesis. Okay, so 
It has no involvement with type 1, Elders Danlos. Next question, true or false? What do you think? True or false? This is true. In fact, every third residue, at a minimum, is a glycine residue. True or false? What do you think? Of course, this is true. Now, the nucleus sends collagen mRNA into the cytoplasm, and then a series of steps occur, including the hydroxylation of lysine and proline. Um, and don't forget, that step requires vitamin C. Then we get the glycosylation of pro-alpha chain hydroxylysine residues and formation of pro-collagen via hydrogen and disulfide bonds. This gives us the pro-collagen helix, which then gets exocytosed into the extracellular space, where the cleavage of pro-collagen C and N terminals at disulfide-rich terminal regions gives us that insoluble tropocollagen product. From here, cross-linking of those tropocollagens helps to reinforce the structure. This is accomplished by a process of covalent lysine hydroxylysine cross-linkage via lysyl oxidase. This process gives us our collagen fibers. Now, don't forget, we get Menke's disease if there's a problem with this cross-linking step of collagen synthesis. Now, Menke's disease is inherited in an excellent recessive manner, and this is characterized by connective tissue disruptions as a result of an impairment in copper absorption and transport. That's caused by a defective Menke's protein, ATP7A. As a result of this mutation, we see a significant decrease in the activity of that enzyme, lysyl oxidase, that results in an incomplete collagen synthesis. So it's faulty. Now, patients with this condition have classic kinky hair. They have hypotonia, delays in both um, in, in bone growth as well as delays in developmental growth. And finally, if you're asked what they are at increased risk of acquiring, you want to say cerebral aneurysms. All right, let's move on to the next question. True or false? True or false? This is false. So I actually mentioned in the last question that this step occurs and forms hydrogen and disulfide bonds. Now, you would need to know that disulfide bonds are covalent bonds in order to correctly answer this. So the basics always come back into play. Next question, true or false? this is false. Now, the reason why this is false is because it is made by cleaving disulfide-rich regions of pro-collagen, not pre-pro-collagen. Remember, pre-pro-collagen is that structure that we have in the cytoplasm prior to the hydroxylation and the glycosylation steps. Next question, true or false? What do you think, true or false? Now, this one's straightforward. This is true. That copper-containing lysyl oxidase is needed to reinforce tropocollagen, and remember, it does so by forming covalent cross-linkages of lysine and hydroxylysine to make collagen fibrils. All right, that is it for the true-false questions. Now let's move on and do a multiple-choice question. So with multiple-choice questions, I'm going to ask you to hit that pause button, try and figure it out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is C. So let's take a closer look at osteogenesis imperfecta, which is inherited in a few different ways, but the most common form is inherited in an autosomal dominant manner. Now the genes affected that lead to this condition are the COL1A1 gene, that's located on the long arm of chromosome 17, and the COL1A2 gene, that is located on chromosome 7. They both provide the instructions needed to make type 1 collagen. Now some of the most common signs and symptoms that you're going to expect from this condition include, of course, the uh, multiple and ongoing fractures that's due to the softening of bones as well you'll see bony deformities now blue sclera is a classic exam finding they like to throw this at you all the time and this is due to thin sclera and the, the sclera is so thin that you can actually see the cor choroidal veins beneath it which causes it to look blue now conductive hearing loss as a result of abnormal ostacle formation is also commonly seen some patients may also demonstrate tooth abnormalities because remember, dentin is made by type 1 collagen. And if there is a defect in this production, that will happen as well. Now make sure that if you are asked about what we can give a patient with osteogenesis imperfecta to at least decrease their risk of fractures, that you consider answering bisphosphonates. All right, let's move on to the next question. Another multiple choice. 
go ahead and hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. The correct answer here is E. So Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome is characterized by hypermobility of the joints, which is the most common type, while the type with joint and skin involvement is known as the classical type. Now, this can be inherited in a variety of different ways, so it's unlikely they're going to ask you that, but you want to know that the, the most common type, which is characterized by hypermobility, is characterized by joint instability, and this is caused by a mutation of the COL5A1 and the COL5A2 genes. These result in a mutation of the type 5 collagen. Now, as I mentioned in a previous question, the vascular type of Ehlers-Danlos is caused by defect in type 3 procollagen and is caused by a mutation of the COL3A1 gene. Now, this type, when meaning the vascular type, this is associated with aortic pathologies. As well, you might see a patient who has ruptured organs or a female who has a gravid uterus. Now, to answer this question specifically, the COL5A1 gene is located on chromosome 9, while COL5A2 and COL3A1, these are both located on chromosome number 2. All right, let's do one more question, and then we'll take a break. As always with the multiple choice, hit that pause button, figure this one out, and then come on back when you think you have the right answer. All right, your correct answer here is B. So when it comes to elastin, just remember, any structure in the body that needs to stretch or expand is going to require a hefty amount of elastin. So think about the lungs, think about the large arteries, the skin, the GI, the bladder, all these things need to stretch and recoil. Now, opposed to collagen, which has hydroxylated residues, elastin is rich in non-hydroxylated glycine, proline, and lysine residues. Now, the elastic properties that are held by elastin are achieved when it gets cross-linked extracellularly. Now, we have a couple of important clinical correlates that we need to keep in mind with elastin. First being that the enzyme elastase, which breaks down elastin, is usually kept in check by what enzyme? The alpha-1 antitrypsin enzyme. Well, if that enzyme becomes deficient, we will see unchecked activity of elastase that chews up and destroys elastin. So all of those tissues that are highly elastic are going to suffer dramatically. That's why COPD is so common in patients with an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency and why it's seen early on in younger people. Now, two important genetic conditions linked to elastin include Marfan syndrome, that's inherited in an autosomal dominant manner and is caused by an FBN1 gene mutation, uh, which is on chromosome 15. This affects the heart, the eyes, and just the skeleton as a whole. Now, this gene defect results in a defect in fibrillin 1. Now, as a result of this, patients have long extremities, they're very tall, they have chest wall deformities, hypermobile joints, long fingers and toes, cystic medial necrosis of the aorta, and the most common cause of death in this patient is the aortic root aneurysm rupture or dissection. Now, this condition is also associated with the mitral valve prolapse and a greater risk of spontaneous pneumothorax. Now, a similar condition is homocystinuria. This presents very similar to, similarly to Marfan's, but it happens for a different reason. Now, while there are many genetic causes of homocystinuria, the most common gene mutation is the CBS gene, which is needed to provide the instructions for forming the cystothionine beta synthase enzyme. That's needed to convert homocysteine into cystothione. Now, a couple ways you can differentiate between Marfan syndrome and homocystinuria are going to include the following. Marfan syndrome is inherited in an autosomal dominant fashion. Homocystinuria is inherited in an autosomal recessive fashion. Those with Marfan syndrome are going to have normal intellect. Those with homocystinuria typically have decreased in intellect. Now, the lens dislocation is a very commonly asked question in both of these conditions. So you want to be able to differentiate between the two based on what they tell you. Oftentimes, it's this patient trips and falls all the time, or this patient bumps their head. So how do we, how do we connect that? Well, in Marfan's, the lens dislocation is upward. So that means if it's dislocated upwards, you're going to have trouble seeing below you. In homocystinuria, it's downward. And then finally, remember that the aortic root pathology is seen in Marfan syndrome, while in homocystinuria, the main vascular complication is thrombosis. So those are some very, very different, very distinct differences. So while they look the same uh, phenotypically, what's going on inside behind the curtains is a lot different. 
All right, let's take a break here. I will see you guys on the next lecture. Thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you found that to be useful and helpful. If you did, do me a huge favor, hit that thumbs up button below. Share this with your friends. If you're not yet subscribed and you want me to let you know every time we release brand new episodes, hit that subscribe button below, set up notifications, and that's exactly what I'll do. If you are interested in the full step one crash course, make sure you use the link in the description below so that you can learn more about that. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Oh,